Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for our webinar on the new federal overtime rules. Um, I'm happy that we have again joining us Chris Schrader, president of Schrader & Associates, who is um, going to um, lead us through an outline of the rules as well as take some questions. Um, when you have questions, then you can type those into the chat box, and Chris will eventually get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, just a reminder that you will need to use your speaker, so you should be um, turning up the volume on those so that you can hear. All right, now um, here is Chris Schrader. Thank you, Anne, and thank the Chamber for this uh, opportunity to uh, provide information to the members. Uh, before I begin, I want to make it clear that uh, I am not an attorney and nothing uh, I'm going to speak to today should be construed of as legal advice. Uh, this is uh, provided for information only and is uh, based upon my more than 27 years of experience in uh, human resource management. So with that, we'll begin. Uh, let's see, it's not moving. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So uh, we're going to go through a couple things in the agenda here. First, the uh, level set. How did how did we get here? Um, what the specific new rules are affecting the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, some legislative activity that's going on that may have impact. Uh, legal action that is currently underway that may have impact. Uh, what employers really need to do now, and then uh, I'll take questions and hopefully provide uh, effective answers. So let's look first uh, at the uh, underlying uh, act here, the Fair Labor Sta Standards Act of 1932. So uh, this is the act, of course, that, that created several important uh, elements of what we regard today as the framework of, of work. Uh, this established the 40-hour work week as the standard work week. Um, it uh, basically eliminated child labor at the time. Uh, back in, in 1932, the primary labor competitor for an adult male seeking work during the Depression was a uh, child, uh, typically an 8-year-old, 8- to 9-year-old child with a coal bucket or a hammer. And uh, they represented a pretty substantial portion of the workforce. And so the child labor provisions basically took that segment of that labor force out of the equation, right? And so that's when they established the child labor laws we're familiar with today of how, lo how old a child has to be to work and uh, things such as that. Uh, that. That act also established a minimum wage. And it also established overtime provisions, right? So this concept of a 40-hour work week didn't mean that employers could only work employees 40 hours a week. What it said was anything beyond that 40 hours a week uh, has to receive, uh, that labor has to receive an overtime premium of 1.5 uh, times the base wage. They also created exemptions from those overtime provisions. Um, and these rest on three prongs to this very day. Uh, first, there is what's referred to as the duties test, meaning what work does an employee actually perform? And these are pretty rigid rules, uh, even with uh, the changes made in the last adjustment to the uh, Act uh, when the administrative exemption was created. Uh, th this is a pretty rigid test. Um, the next thing they created was the salary basis test. And so this means what you think it means, right? The same amount of pay is made on a routine basis uh, regardless of the number of hours worked. So if you're a salaried uh, personnel working at Indiana University, you're paid once a month. Uh, if you're salaried and working uh, in the private sector, you're usually paid uh, bi-weekly or every other week. Uh, so you have to meet that test. And then in 1949, the salary minimum test was added to the Act. And so what this said is there's got to be a minimum amount of salary paid in order to meet the qualifications. So this is the key thing here. In order for a person, in order for a, a role rather, to be exempt from the overtime provisions of the Act, all three prongs have to be satisfied. All three. It's not best two out of three or one out of three. It's all three. So the duties test the salary basis test and the salary minimum test all have to be passed in order for that role 
to be exempt. So let's let's look at, at how we got here. So the, the president directed the DOL to act uh, uh, March of a couple of a couple years ago uh, to address the issue uh, of of compensation in the nation, and he sent a memo to Secretary Perez directing him to modernize and simplify overtime rule uh, exception rules, and in specific, he wanted a way uh, to make more workers eligible for overtime pay. All right, so that was the mechanism by which this was going to happen. So they weren't going to go after minimum wage or anything like that. The specific target was making more employees eligible for overtime, right? So that, that right there meant that you were going to see an adjustment to one of those three prongs uh, in the FLSA. The DOL uh, proposed the rule, opened the comment period. They received 270,000 comments between assembly July and September 2015. And this was actually more comments than they received for the Affordable Care Act. Just to give you an idea of how important this was to employers in particular, a huge uh, amount of comments came in. Um, it, unfortunately, those comments did not appear to have much of an impact on what the, uh, on what the department wanted to do, except on the issue of the salary floor. Uh, the salary floor itself was a number uh, of, of great dispute. Once it became clear that this, is, uh, this was the angle that the government was going to take, uh, then a lot of stakeholders started acting. Um, the, um, the president heard from many members of his caucus in Congress who saw this as a, a unique opportunity uh, to do something uh, dramatic. They urged him to go big. And the recommendation from the caucus was $99,000 a year as a base. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the House Republicans in particular wanted something a lot lower than that, uh, something uh, just a little bit above the current floor. And other stakeholders were all over the lot. $45,000 got kicked around by uh, Department of Commerce, um, the, the uh, Democratic caucus in the Senate weighed in with around $65,000. And so this number moved around a lot, especially in the last days leading up to the published rule in May, on May 18 of 2016. And so that's when they announced the minimum salary floor change. They also announced that commissions may now be considered in meeting the minimum salary test. This is new. They, they have never done that before, but commissions are now to be considered. And they offered no changes to the duties test. This part was the most shocking to the HR community because when this act is touched, and it's not touched a lot, but when it is by Congress, they typically move on multiple elements of it. And the duties test has been the one that is most frequently revisited because the nature of work changes over time, right? And, and so it's oftentimes very important to revisit the duties because the, the nature of work changes. But they did not do this this time. So this is solely based on this, uh, on this floor. So let's look at the new rules. Um, uh, an increase in the uh, current salary level uh, uh, necessary to maintain the white collar exemption moves up from 23,660 its current rate to 47,476. Um, the annual the the increase in compensation for highly compensated employees and th this is this is a rare category, but it was for a highly uh, compensated employee. Uh, that minimum duty test was $100,000 a year. That goes up to $134,004 a year. So the, the issue here <laughs> is that, quite frankly, if you want to uh, uh, avoid the overtime provisions in their entirety, regardless of what the person does, um, you, should, uh, uh, you could pay them $134,000 a year and call them exempt. I don't recommend uh, uh, employers do that. Uh, but that's a way that's a way to meet that. Um, they also created a mechanism to automatically update salary and compensation levels every three years. This to me is is the single most important element in in this rule. 
uh, this is not to understate moving from 23,660 to 47,476. I mean, a, a plus 100 percent increase in it within the scope of a single year of a rule being published is simply unheard of. So I don't want to minimize that. But putting this putting these increase on an automatic ratchet every three years has significant implications for salary planning downstream because now, now you know for certain that those wages are going to go up without any certainty that your revenues or your donations will go up. So th this is a significant impact. What they're going to base this on is the 40th percentile of salaries in the poorest census region of the U.S., which is the South. So if, if you just looked back and you took census data over the years and looked at that salary growth in those periods and you simply did, did standard regression analysis, you, you just spreadsheet this out and push it out and say, okay, I'll extrapolate this, what will that mean? right? That's not to say it's the exact number, but if as history has gone and so it goes in the next three years, then you could reasonably plot that that floor would move up to like $51,200, okay? So that's the, that's the impact of that. And that only continues to move. That ratchet really only moves one way. Now, you might say to yourself, why would the Department of Labor do this if we can't have any certainty that revenues or economic growth will occur? Why would we push the numbers? And the response is this. The Department of Labor fundamentally believes that the way the economy has developed and the way that work has developed has gotten too far away from the original intent of the act. If you go back to the press conference, you look at some of the things that they wrote afterwards, they point to the fact that when the exemptions were first created, only 5% of the workforce was eligible for exemption. 95% of the workforce was hourly by virtue this act was originally passed. And so what they're saying is, is that right now you've got better than 45% of the workforce that is exempt. And so we are out of whack relative to the original intent of the act. And so the purpose of the ratchet is to purposely make more and more people hourly workers over time until such a point as the original ratios from 1932 are reestablished. There's also a provision for the employers, as I said, to use a non-discretionary bonus and incentive payments to satisfy up to 10% of the salary amount, so long as those amounts are paid on a quarterly basis or more frequently. We're Issues, Chris. Okay. Sorry. No, it's quite all right. So, one second. We're going to check. Audio. Audio. If you could. So, yep, yeah, we're using the microphone. Ooh, what about speaker? No, we want to use, we want to use this microphone. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. We're doing a quick sound check. Oh, okay. Thank you, April. So it looks like it's working for some but not others. Oh, um, okay. We are recording this, and so we can send out a link afterwards. Go ahead. Sorry, Chris. Very good. No, uh, I, I apologize uh, for for that. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Ann pointed out, this is being recorded, and so I'm sure the recording quality will be high. All right. So the, the, the next question I always get, does this really apply to every job? And the answer is that is no, uh, it, it doesn't. Uh, farmers and family members are exempt. Uh, farmers have been exempt for a long time. If you've got a small family business and your family members are working for you, uh, you can continue to legally exploit your children as long as you want. Uh, this, this, is, this act was not designed to, uh, to go that uh, low. 
Uh, elected officials are exempt uh, legally. Uh, they are they do not have to be uh, paid a, a uh, minimum salary, um, and uh, the uh, those are set by the the, uh, uh, the elected bodies. Uh, freight drivers freight drivers are exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act because there's actually another piece of legislation that affects them. And that's, con that's always been common in the U.S. for freight, for rail, for things like that. Uh, they've always had their own laws. Uh, lawyers, doctors, teachers, outside sales, clergy roles are not subject to the minimum salary. They do not have to. They can be exempt uh, every other way, right? They meet the duties test. They meet, uh, uh, they meet the uh, salary test, but they are not required to meet the minimum salary uh, 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 provision. Uh, so if you, you are an employer and you, you have uh, these roles uh, with your uh, organization, uh, they're not subject to the minimum salary. Uh, having said that, oftentimes these roles are highly compensated, so I can't say that it's necessarily that, that, that germane, uh, but the fact of the matter is they don't apply. Uh, so what, I, I, what organizations are subject to the Act? And, and the answer there is, uh, most all employees, uh, bluntly put, and it's whether you're profit or not for profit. I have a separate slide here on not for profit. I'll get to a little bit later, but most of those. Um, the bullet you see here refers to what's called the enterprise test. So if you have annual sales or you do business in the volume of $500,000 a year, this doesn't apply to hospitals or schools, then, then you're subject to the act at the enterprise level. Um, if you conduct any kind of interstate commerce, and to be clear here, the, the, there have been many court cases, and this was decided long ago, that, uh, that the courts take a very uh, liberal view of interstate commerce. So if you send a piece of mail over state lines, if you get an email that, that was generated over state lines, if you send that email out over state lines or forward anything like that, if you do any kind of business at all, order from Amazon, order an airline ticket, do anything, um, you're conducting interstate commerce subject to it uh, there. Um, there are, in reality, there are few exceptions. When it became clear to the government that there were a lot of exceptions to this, they just created another rule that said uh, there you can be exempt under under your own individual duties. So if your organization would otherwise be exempt, but the duties that the person performs involve anything in engaging in out of uh, over state lines and things like that. And I, again, I emphasize: take a phone call, get an email. It's a very very low bar. Um, then they're going to be subject under the provision. So anyone listening to the phone here, the safest bet to play is that you are subject to the Act. That is the safest bet to play. So let's look a little bit at pending legislation because uh, December 1st isn't here yet, and so uh, there's a lot of activity going on. The, um, there are a number of acts in Congress dealing with this, but the one that has the greatest likelihood of moving is the Overtime Reform and Enhancement Act. This is an act uh, authored by uh, Representative Schrader, uh, no relation to me, although the name is spelled the same, uh, yeah. Democrat from Oregon, and Representative Cuellar, uh, uh, representative uh, Democrat from Texas. And the reason that, that I highlight this bill is this is the only bill that isn't Republican authored. Uh, and, and so a bipartisan piece of legislation is the one most likely to pass, right? Uh, there are other bills that Republicans have generated that have tons of co-sponsors, all Republicans, no Democrats. This particular bill has five Democrat co-sponsors and I believe seven Republican co-sponsors. Uh, it has been assigned to the Committee on Education and the Workforce in the House. Uh, the key provisions in this act, it would phase in the increases over four years. This is quite frankly what is typically done. Increases of this magnitude are almost always phased in. They, I've never seen one hit just in one fell swoop. Uh, but Representative Schrader's bill says we're going to phase in over four years, so it would go to 35,984 on December 1 of this year, then 39 and change on, in 17, uh, 43 and change in 18, and finally 47,476 
the current act number, but that wouldn't happen until December of 2019. Okay. Uh, most importantly, again to me, this eliminates the automatic escalation every three years and in says directs the Department of Labor to review it and come back to Congress with recommendations. Um, this bill has a tremendous amount of common sense in it. And that's why I think it is forecasted to have a 1% chance of passing. Uh, and the president has said that he will veto this bill even if it passes both the House and the Senate. So I wouldn't hold my breath on this one, but if any piece of legislation moves, my betting money is on this one. There's also pending legal action, right? If you can't get it done legislatively, go to the courts and see if you can get a judge to agree. So we have two lawsuits currently underway. A coalition of 21 states, including Indiana, are suing on the basis of the 10th Amendment. So this is a constitutional argument, and those of you who are familiar with the 10th Amendment, this is the one that basically says, power not explicitly granted to the federal government in the Constitution rests entirely with the people and the, or with the states and the people therein. They, that's, a, that's a truncated version of the 10th Amendment there. So the states are basically saying to the federal government, you don't have the authority to come in and uh, do this to us. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is also suing. They are doing it on a different uh, argument. They're saying that this is overreach under the Fair Labor Standards Act itself. So they're saying this is a overreach, a misinterpretation of the authority, if you will, of the government under the act. Um, uh, both cases are, have been filed in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. That was not done by accident. This is a very favorable district, especially to constitutional arguments made under the 10th Amendment. So certainly the venue of this does not surprise me at all relative to 21 states that filed. Um, uh, I, I did not do enough reading on the district uh, to know whether or not the Commerce uh, Department of Commerce's argument would find purchase with that court, uh, but I'm sure that's why the Tenth Amendment case ended up there. Um, so does the rule apply to not-for-profits? This is a very simple question, unfortunately, with a very complex answer uh, because it depends upon several categories. Uh, first of all, the nature of the revenue, uh, where does the money come from and how is that brought in and the nature of it itself? Um, where the employees perform the duty is also an important element and the type of work performed. And all of these, the, the, the response to these questions, quite frankly, are all over the lot. And um, for people that are, that are prepared to ask me questions, uh, I want to give you some foreshadowing here that I don't want to disappoint you, but it can be very hard in the course of a webinar to tease out the necessary level of specific information to be really comfortable providing guidance. I'll do the best I can, but I warn you now, it will be directional in nature. Um, most, uh, again, I think will qualify under individual coverage. When all, all, the, all the work is done, I think they'll do that. Now. This is very important for certain types of not-for-profits for, for, for because the government did something a little unusual here and what the Department of Labor said was we're not going to change the act, we're just not going to enforce it for a particular type of employer. Kind of begs the question of why you'd want to do it in the first place, but we'll let that one go. So here's what they're doing. They have said that they will not enforce the higher salary threshold until March 17 of 2019 for providers of Medicaid-funded services for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities in residential homes and facilities with 15 or fewer beds. Those employers will have an additional 28 months grace period to comply. So if you are a not-for-profit that does this, you have until March 27, 2019. If you are a not-for-profit that does not do this, you can reasonably expect them to enforce the act. So what employers need to do now? Um, you really need to make sure your job descriptions are up to date, and if you don't have them, now's a real good time to do it because this is going to be your first line of defense 
in the event that you are audited for a wage and hour uh, uh, violation. Um, you need to reevaluate your roles to make sure you have people in proper classification. The one complaint that the Department of Labor has had for a long time is that workers are misclassified all over the place and that misclassification is rampant. And I can tell you in my experience in practice of HR and my years in consulting that that is largely correct. This is not done by intent to keep people from earning overtime pay. Quite to the contrary, most workers and most employers regard a person in an exempt role as being a role of higher value and of greater stature within an organization. Workers aspire to be exempt. I have had employers literally tell me that the reason a role is exempt is because the person asked. The person mm -hmm. asked. And, and, and so you, you really need to get crisp around this because this really, really matters now. Um, you need to determine where your current salaries plot against the floor of 47,476, right? So how many are above that line and how many are below that line? Because that then helps you determine what your strategy and tactics will be. Here's an important thing. If you are not already tracking the labor hours of exempt roles, you need to do that because this is vital for setting wage rates. Now, many people listening here are going to have no concept of what this is because you're sitting here listening to this saying, wasn't that the damn point? Uh, yes, it was. It was. Unfortunately, if you're going to have to convert a role that is exempt but for the salary floor, right? You're meeting the salary test. You're meeting the duties test. But you just don't have the wherewithal in the organization or the organizational desire, if you got a lot of roles, to, to climb all the way up to 47, 476. So that means that that person is going to be hourly after December 1. Okay, fine. What is the hourly rate? You don't know. You don't know. And so you need to get a handle around those hours because here's the rub. If you simply take the amount of salary they are making now and divide that by 2080, that's how many work hours are in a 40-hour work week in a 52-week year, 2,080. You divide that number, you'll come up with an hourly rate. But that is subject to the overtime provisions of the Act. So if those individuals actually work more than 40 hours a week, you're paying time and a half for every hour over that. So that simple mathematical evaluation only works if you can put a hard cap and control on the 40 hours of work. So here are some things you need to consider. How will workers react to less flexibility? The main reason workers typically want to be exempt is so they can be off of the clock and have the flexibility of where they spend their time and how they spend it, right? Because this is how it works in today's world. You have a non-exempt employee, you have an exempt employee. The exempt employee says, was taking my daughter to school today and she handed me a note that's been in her backpack for the last three days. It says there's a play this afternoon at three o'clock. So I'm going to leave at about 2.30. I'm going to the play and I'll come back and do the work or I'll just work from home. I'll have my uh, cell phone with me. Uh, I'll mute it during the performance. Other than that, you know where to reach me. And their boss says, fine, enjoy the play. The hourly employee walks in and says, I took my kid to school today. I just found the note in their backpack. It says we're going to play today. It's three o'clock. Can I leave? Well, now you have to look at the rules for hourly workers to request time off. In most cases, they require more than just a couple of hours notice. As a matter of fact, unless you're sick or ill, I mean, or hospitalized or something like that, normally a lot of work rules for hourly employers require notice for doing that. Now, that doesn't mean that you as an employer will necessarily say, no, you can't go. As a matter of fact, I think the majority of employers have said, yes, you can go. That's the kind of world hourly workers live in, and they know it. See, hourly workers know the drill. You take someone who's been in an exempt role for most of their adult life, and now you tell them to be on the clock, I guarantee you they do not know how to think that way. 
So you need to have consideration for how you train them to do that. Um, how workers react to clock punching. I have two words, for, I have one key word for you there, negatively. Uh, they are not going to like it, but you have a duty here. If you're an employer and you have workers who are working hourly, you have a duty to collect and manage that time. And they're gonna have to participate in that. What are the implications for future pay increases? This to me is a real tough one. Uh, a CEO I was working with on this particular issue, one of my, one of my clients really said it best, I think. He, he said, Chris, as I, as I look at this, and you know, not knowing exactly where the revenues are gonna be, if the costs are going to be driven up no matter what three years from now, what kind of pay increase should I give in an intervening period or should I really give one at all and then simply hit the mark when it's presented to me? Because I don't know that I necessarily want to overshoot per se, because now I've, I've got to pay attention to what that is. Now, he hasn't reached a conclusion on this yet, but I thought that was a very interesting question to ask. If the numbers are going to go up some uncertain number, then what does that imply for what you do in the intervening period? I think that will vary from company to company and industry to industry. What are the implications for advancement? This to me is the one that's particularly hard on younger workers. One of the biggest advantages of a low salary floor and the tests as they existed is you could generally speaking take a, a younger worker, give them a little bit of a pay increase, give them additional responsibility, and then see how they performed at relatively low cost to the employer but at great advantage to that employee. And that as that younger worker developed, then of course they were worth more to the organization and you could ratchet them along the line and pay them more and more and more. Well, now you can't really do that. And I was explaining this to some of the students in, in one of the classes I teach at Indiana University. And I said, you know, when you graduate in January, this is gonna be the minimum salary floor for an exempt worker. So those of you who don't command at least a $47,000 a year salary coming out of college, and I'm here to tell you many won't, that means they're going to be punching a clock. Let me tell you, they were quite shocked and not happy. And that's going to be your workforce. What are the implications for organizational design? How do you actually allocate work and run it with these hourly workers, right? What are the implications for compensation strategy and design? This really gets called into question now in, in a way you never had to think through. And I keep on saying strategy here because I, there may be an injunction, right? And this may get pushed off for a while. The, the, the legislation may pass the House, but, but the president won't sign it. You have an election coming up. And then depending upon who gets in the office, you might get a difference on this or not. That to me, quite frankly, is unclear. But I think for planning purposes, you need to understand that this is where things are headed one way or the other. And I think your strategy has to take that into account. Uh, how many managers do you need, which is really another way of saying how many can you afford, right? Um, what are the implications for recruiting? Uh, because I can tell you right now that what we are discussing today has been so poorly reported, not referenced, it's not an issue in either campaign. Quite frankly, the number of people I run into on a weekly basis who tell me they have no clue this rule is even coming is large. So here's the thing. If the employers who are going to be subject to it don't know that's happening, what do you think the odds are that the workers have a clue? And I think the odds are really, really poor. So you're going to have to think through the recruiting and how that messaging goes out where the expectations of the people you're recruiting are not quite at the level set that you are today, right? How do you handle wage compression? Uh, though anybody on the phone who's in HR or anybody on the phone who does compensation knows what wage compression is. And wage compression is fundamentally what happens when new entrants to the workforce are paid more than earlier entrants, right? So a good example of this is what happened to IT in the 90s. IT, believe it or not, did not 
pay terribly lucratively and, and, uh, for, for too many roles prior to the explosion of PCs and networks as we know them today. When that exploded, the number of people who actually knew how to do that was in vast undersupply to the demand for it. So the wages skyrocketed. So a person coming in who barely knew token ring networks could come in and, and demand and command a salary right up there with or possibly exceeding the IT person you'd had in your company for the last 10 years. So that's compression. So this is what's going to happen here. You're going to have workers at your company who've been exempt, who maybe are making 47, maybe making 50 or something like that. And the next hire you make and you want it to be exempt, you bring someone in and pay them 47, 476, and they haven't been at the company six years, and they didn't start out at 31,000, and they didn't pay their dues, but now you're paying this, them this amount of money. And the answer is, yeah, you are if you want them to be exempt, right? You have to do that. So that causes wage compression, and that it creates employer relations issues, ultimately. If uh, you can't afford overtime, uh, what do you do? Do you use part-timers? That's possibly a way to do it. Independent contractors, another possible way to do it. But, boy, you can't have a lot of control of an independent contractor. I don't know. I'm one of them. Uh, do you want to hire more full-time staff and maybe chop everybody's hours back to less than 40 and really take yourself out of, uh, out of the mix for uh, overtime exposure? That may be a way to do it. Does outsourcing make sense against this backdrop? Um, what difference can technology make? I had another CEO, and I, I knew, sorry, it was a CFO, CFO, and I knew exactly where he was going when we were walking through this piece of it uh, last year. Uh, he said, so Chris, the cost of technology tends to fall over time while the quality improves. And what you're telling me is that the labor costs go up whether they improve or not, whether the labor itself improves or not. And I said, yeah, I'm saying that. And he said, okay, I think I never, but we better need, we better look at, at in uh, using technology to replace these roles downstream because one cost drops and the other one goes up. And I said, I will not argue with you in the slightest. Um, does a salary non-exempt method coupled with an agreement make sense? So um, this, you're turning on the Wayback Machine, going all the way back to, to 1949 and the 1950s for when people are trying to come up with solutions when the uh, minimum salary for us first created. So salary non-exempt method basically says, okay, I'm going to treat you as exempt, so you're going to work the same hours that you've been working, you're going to be doing everything you're doing, and you still have to punch the clock, but I'm going to pay you the same amount, you know, every single, you know, other week or, or uh, every two weeks, um, but I will pay you if you work overtime. So, you know, how does that make me feel? Um, you, ha you still have to have a mechanism for knowing when they're going to work over 40 hours, Generally speaking, I will tell you, uh, I have one client right now doing this. Uh, they actually decided, more than a few of my clients decided to start complying even before December 1 because they wanted to figure out, make sure they could actually do it before December 1 hit. <laughs> wanted a couple months to get it wrong before, uh, before it really hurt. Uh, I have one client doing this right now, but they have very, very strict controls that when a person in that category wants to work overtime, they have to get approval. Otherwise, they can't work more than 40 hours, and work over 40 hours is not approved. And as a matter of fact, if people on the phone who have a lot of hourly workers know this, it, it is actually m most all businesses have rules that say an hourly worker cannot of their own decide to work overtime. And if they work overtime and they didn't have approval to do that, that's actually a violation of a work rule, and that's punishable by discipline. Most have that. Most have that rule in place. Uh, does a fluctuating work week method make sense? Uh, this one is pretty obscure. I cannot conceivably explain it in the amount of time we have for this uh, um, uh, presentation. But but the, the general gist of it here is in fluctuating work week, the number of hours worked per week fluctuate pretty wildly, but in a somewhat predictable fashion. So. 
th this is a very narrow exception. You have to have really crisp grasp of the hours worked and, and, and who are working and how they do it. This is a solution, but it's, it's going to be very a very, very narrow one and probably one not suited to move most rules. So with that, I think I moved through this sufficient time to uh, take some questions. So, uh, Anne, do you have any that uh, came in there? Yeah, there were a few. One was, um, I think it was referring to the three-year salary floor increase. If that was going to be effective on December 1st, then in three more years. So uh, the, the question was, relative to the, the uh, three-year uh, automatic increase, if you will, is, is that tied to December 1st also? And, and the answer to that is yes. So that three-year clock would start ticking on December 1 of 2016. And so, um, so it's going to be 16, 17, 18. So December 1 of 19 would be the, um, would be the next increase. And then it looks like there's one Here we go. Um, if you are a nonprofit with annual income of less than five hundred thousand, are you still subject to the law? So the answer to that question is, you're not going to be subject at the enterprise level, right? That's the the company level test. So then you need to look at the individual work performed by the workers in the role. So the question is are they subject to that? Um, the easiest way to access to answer this question for yourself, uh, Google is your friend on this. You can go to the Department of Labor site and, and ask, uh, you know, query what the individual um, duty rules are uh, for, uh, for exemption uh, from the, from the uh, coverage, if you will, of this act, and, and that will tell you what those are. But again, these are very hard to escape. They, the whole purpose of, of, of making people eligible under the individual uh, role piece of it was to sweep everybody in. I mean, that was, the, that was the, the, the stated intent of the act itself. So again, people are sending emails, people purchasing anything for the company, um, anything that goes over state lines and things like that, then, then the role itself is engaged in interstate commerce. And so you're probably going to do it. So go ahead and look those up. But that's a very that's a very high bar to climb over. And then I think we had one more. And it was it maybe was more of a comment about the government exempting the businesses if they receive Medicaid funding or they're delayed. Is that so so this had, has to do with not for profits. So if you are in the for-profit arena and you're providing this type of service, that, that's, that's not your exemption. This was the not-for-profit exemption, right? So they did that for not-for-profits in that line of work. So the, the first test is, are you not-for-profit? And then if the answer to that is yes, then do you do this? And then you don't have the enforcement un until 19. I think I think that answered the question. Yeah, I think they're saying yeah, if they are not for profit and they give some of those services for free. <laughs> give some of those services for free. But they don't take any Medicaid funding. Maybe like a well, volunteers then, and then Medicaid Well, then it's how are they? How are they? Yeah, again, it's your pro if it's your profit or not for profit status that decides decides that. Um, and then this is what are employers actually having to do beginning December 1st. Okay, all right. So so you have to comply. <laughs> you have to comply on December 1, right? So the act goes into effect on December 1. So to put this in, in the most blunt way possible, if you're making $35,000 a year and you're currently exempt, and, and let's just make this very simple and say the easiest way, you are a manager and or super your manager and you have two at least two people reporting to you that that satisfies the, the, the most simple test in 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 the duties test and salary test for the uh, then the salary test for for the act so if that's you and you're only making thirty five thousand dollars come December 1 one of two things is going to be true if you are still exempt you hit the lottery 
because you're being paid $47,476 and that will be reflected on your next paycheck in December. Or you are no longer considered exempt, you are hourly and you're making something close, uh, probably right on the beam of what you're making now, but you're actually punching the clock, but your job otherwise hasn't changed. You're still supervising the two people and everything else, but you're now punching the clock along with everybody else. And that takes effect on December 1 of this year. And Chris, can you talk a little bit maybe about the penalty and then the increase in the amount of auditors that have been hired just to stress the, sure. how serious they are taking people? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so generally speaking, when you're looking at violations of the act, the, the fines typically run in the, the thousands of dollars and they take into account whether or not it was willful. Right, you you knew better, and you and you made a concrete decision uh, to do otherwise. Um, uh, so you have that penalty. The other, the thing that is typically the most injurious in in cases like this, because where where this was is where these things materialize and who they're investigated by, is the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor. And so they would treat this like they would any other misclassification issue, right? So. One of the first things that would happen, uh, wage and hour would come in, they demand all your payroll records, they would likely interview people. Um, by the way, this is not the fun bunch of the federal government, I assure you, when wage and hour comes in. And, um, and they'll not just look at the individual who complained, they'll look at everybody in the whole company. They don't walk in the door and say, we're only interested in one thing. You open up everything. And they look for any other misclassifications they can find. Then, after they've done all that, they look at your time records. Here's the killer. If the person who complained said they worked 150 hours a week and you have no record that says they didn't, the Department of Labor takes their word for it. I am not kidding. They take their work for it. So unless you have documentation that proves otherwise, it is the claimant's standard that, that the government runs with. And so then you're liable for the back pay, you're liable for damages, any missed overtime, that had to be paid too. And if this has happened, if it wasn't just this one worker, it was more workers, then you're probably staring at an individual class action shoot the minute one of those people talks to, an, talks to a lawyer. So this is not something to get wrong. Now, uh, Anne made a point. Uh, about auditors. The fact of the matter is, is that historically, one of the reasons that misclassification has been rampant in the past and not caught by the government is that the bulk of it happens at small and mid-sized employers. If you are a large corporation, if you have a functioning HR department, it's highly unlikely you have misclassification. Highly unlikely. And, and so the government really doesn't look at those folks too often unless a complaint comes in. They have always known that the misclassification occurs at the small and mid-sized employer level. And so to that end, they've literally hired tens of thousands of more auditors and trained them. And they have a focus and intent of auditing small and mid-sized companies. They know this is where the likely violation is going to occur. Now, the fact of the matter is they are going to work the same way the IRS does. The IRS doesn't have enough auditors to audit every single tax return. They just make sure that when they catch somebody who is wrong, they hit them with a hammer. And so my advice to everybody on the phone here is that you don't want to be the pinata at the wage and hour division's party. So don't, don't get wrong on this and have an auditor then find it because they're going to be looking. They're going to be looking to, to punish some people, to find some violations so that they can put the fear of the Lord into everybody else. So you, you don't want to be that, that person. Let's make sure there's no more questions. Okay, I think that's it. Um, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And um, we will go ahead and we will send this webinar out later today. 
And uh, uh, for uh, those of you still on uh, the webinar, I have my contact information up here. So if you have uh, more specific questions that um, didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to get addressed here, or if any information I provided was not sufficiently clear, then please do not hesitate to contact me uh, uh, through any of the methods you see here. And thank you again to the Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity to make this presentation.